drive a lot of sand. Oh, sorry. Let me too. Easy one today. Hello, you are listening to the Thomas McNair podcast. All Thomas McNair. All the time. Have you enjoyed your break? I did and equally didn't enjoy mine. Remember how I said at the end of the last podcast? I kind of joked unless I'd be back unless I get sick. Well, guess who got sick? <laughs> Something happened with my tonsil. And it got swollen. And I didn't get it looked at until I needed to go into hospital for my uh, blood transfusion. As you know, I don't want to be in hospital more times than I have to be. This month, not counting tomorrow, I've been in a hospital for like a combined total of probably a hundred and sixty hours or something ridiculous. I needed some blood but they couldn't decide amongst themselves what was wrong with my throat so nothing was done about it I just kept on taking painkiller and luckily it healed itself at least, I think it's healed, it stopped hurting, and I looked down the back of my throat and there's nothing red anymore. So, this happened smack dab in the, well, not really in the middle, but just after the first, well, yes, smack dab at the start of the film festival. Remember I was telling you how I was getting excited and planning to go to the film festival? Well, I did. Because I don't plan ahead very often. It's hard, given my condition. I've just got into this attitude of not planning for the future. One of the only things that I plan for is the Leeds Film Festival. It comes once a year. And I enjoy doing it. It's usually the only thing I enjoy from my year. But this year I've been up to quite a lot and it's been quite an extraordinary year. Had my podcast fitted. And next week, or possibly tomorrow, depending on what my doctor says, I am starting a new drug trial. This is the first new drug that I've tried since I was 16, well, just before my 16th birthday, I was having a lot of back pain. Well, no, but just before my 15th birthday, actually. Just before my 15th birthday, I was having a lot of back pain. I ended up having to be in a wheelchair because it hurt too much. And I was on painkiller every day. And it led to a point 
of unhappiness that I've never felt before. Because I don't know if I should justify it. There was nothing to justify what I did. But it was... The pain was so bad I started to hurt myself. And I remember the climax of this period of my life um, was New Year's Day. The night before, so New Year's Eve, I'd taken a painkiller and drank some alcohol and I did not drink that day. So I wanted to not feel the pain and so I cut myself. But I don't really have the strength to penetrate my own skin. So there were just scratches. But there were scratches that bled still. Anyway, on New Year's Day, I woke up. Probably with a hangover. I don't know what a hangover feels like. But I, I was sick. Um, I couldn't really be bothered hiding the scratches from my mum and so she was made aware of them when she looked after me that day. But nothing was ever said. The only thing that happened next was Obviously, they tried to find a treatment for me straight away for my pain, for my back problems, and there was one. There was this drug called pomidronate. And that changed things. That got me out of a wheelchair, and it never gave me any pain or any extreme pain again. But on the uh, psychological side, I started seeing a, a, an art therapist who was actually somebody who I'd, I'd known within the hospital for a while, who had started this like child psychology degree or whatever. And obviously my mum was out of her depths and didn't know what to do, so this lovely woman who'd known us for a good few years through the hospital offered to be my therapist. Um, nothing ever happened again after that. It was just the pain was too much and I wanted a way to control my own pain, and I felt like if I gave myself something else to focus on, it would hurt less in my back. So this new drug treatment that I'm starting, possibly tomorrow, it is called EPO. And what it's supposed to do is boost my own body's production of blood cells. Meaning that I have to have less transfusions. However, the side effect of my own body producing blood cells means that I have more of my faulty blood cells. The blood cells that make me allergic to the sun, basically. These these blood cells, they can't 
form properly so they break apart. And if more of my body, more of if my body is producing more of those cells, then there's a possibility that I could become even more sensitive to the sun, uh, to the to, to the light in general. And I will certainly be able to keep an eye on that. I remember, I'm going back again now, when I was, just before my 13th birthday, <laughs> I had a bone marrow transplant, and uh, I was on chemotherapy, and I went into isolation for a good six or eight weeks, because I wasn't having the transfusions and my this chemotherapy was killing off my own cells and I was kind of starting from scratch again I became very very hypersensitive to light just like opening my eyes and seeing light through a blind was painful, it irritating. So I do have some precedent to how my body reacts. By the way, the bone marrow transplant did not work, obviously. <laughs> um, I don't know if that needed stating. It was from my sister. She donated her bone marrow, and we were, a, it was probably the closest match I was going to get. So, the fact that it didn't work, it just, it was down to my age, I was too old. Patients with my condition need to have a blood trans, need to have a bone marrow transplant. as young as possible for it to succeed. And there was talk of me having one when I, went, when I was as young as nine. Unfortunately, it just didn't happen until I was 13, so. <sighs> I don't know. I wrote in my diary. Do you want me to get the exact? I always said that I'm gonna read past entries from my diary. But that would mean getting out of bed. And I've just woken up. I won't break my train of thought. I'll just give you the gist of it. In my diary, I wrote that I quite liked having something special about me. So the fact that the bone marrow transplant did not work and did not cure me. I could see the good in it. When I went back to school after this, huge break I left high school in March 1999 and then went back at the start of the year 9 in September all the friends I'd made in the first year of high school, all my, my friends had kind of drifted away and I found it very hard to fit in. The only friend I felt I had was a new girl, because I felt we were starting from an equal platform. And what didn't help as well was that I experienced a lot of bullying from a girl in particular who and she had kind of the power to turn the whole class against you oh my god this <laughs> is sounding so high school but it was it was high school it didn't the bullying never upset me 
it was just the fact that the friends that I thought I had were not no longer there. So, after my transfusion one evening, my mum was taking my sister to an audition for a, a, a musical. And I asked my mum if I could audition. And I did. And I got through and my sister didn't. This musical was performed at the Millennium Dome the year it opened, the only year it opened. Explain to me again what the purpose of that was. Because I liked the Millennium Dome the one time I was there. It was a fun museum. So through this drama group that we had, that I was a part of, I made lots of new friends. I think I've said in the previous podcast how easy it was to make friends when you're younger. And I did. Now I don't feel any hostility at all. It was a safe environment. I guess that's kind of a, a running theme with drama groups. And that was where I was made aware of <laughs> this is gonna, the phrasing that I was just about to use. That was where I was made aware of gay people. No, but it was true. There was a boy there who was gay. Um, and it was the gossip, but I didn't really understand what that meant. I just knew that he had a male friend. No, he didn't sound like a friend. He sounded like an elderly relative. But he he had a friend who was like 14. And and this 14-year-old was like confused in his sexuality. And so that was the gossip at the time. And... It, I just didn't understand it from like from my point of view. If you like someone, then you like them. I liked a girl during that process, and that was that. You know, that it doesn't matter if you like a girl. It doesn't matter if you like a boy. That was my train of thought. It didn't occur to me that I also like boys. So the friends I made, all most of them went to the same school. So my mum asked me if I wanted to change high schools. This was halfway. This was like again March two thousand. You know the bullying had continued. And my mum, and God bless her, she tried to put a stop to it. And she talked to my teacher, but the teacher basically said, you know, I would in this instance talk to the parents of the girl bullying. But the parent threatened my teacher physically with physical violence. So, yeah. My mum pulled me out of the school because she didn't feel that it was safe for me. And I started my new high school in May. And I was much happier until the pain in my back started. But then that got fixed, and then everything was fine. la de be la de da So as I was saying, that was the first... And, well not the first, sorry. The most recent 
drug treatment I've had. So this EPO will be a new experience. I haven't had a drug trial in 12 years. Obviously, if it means I have less blood transfusions, it means I'm in hospital less. It means I have more freedom in life. And the amount of freedom that I've got just from having a partner, that alone suits me. But to get the, the thought of more freedom from a hospital, it will just give me more independence. I'll be able to travel more. I want, I'll be able to plan things. I start to want to plan things. You know, I, I do have made up dreams of going on holidays on my own. On a cruise. And I could do that if I didn't have to go into hospital. So, a lot of these, I don't know whether to, I think I'm still going to keep the podcast schedule every two weeks, because I'm getting this one in under the wire. I didn't have any, well, I, that's a, a complete lie, I did have time to record it, I just chose not to. I was so wiped out after the film festival. I saw 29 films in two weeks. And two days out of those two weeks, I was in hospital. So it was technically 29 films in 12, 12 days. So on the Saturday when I had some free time, a free evening, I just ordered pizza and binge watched the new series of American Horror Story. And by binge watched, I mean I got two episodes in and then my mother came home drunk. This is my 55 year old mother. (laughs) Um, She's been telling people that she's 57. And I'm like, mum, if you were born in 1959, then you are 55. And she's like, no, I'm definitely not 55, I'm older. And I was like, why are you trying to make yourself older? It's crazy. She doesn't act in, she doesn't look it. She, my high school friends were always like, I couldn't believe that I had a 40 year old mother. She looks so young. And obviously sometimes she acts quite young as well. So, I didn't have any time to record it on Saturday. And... It was my transfusion yesterday. And I said I would use the opportunity of being somewhere for like eight hours of doing nothing but get blood infused. I would use that to record. But I didn't feel in my safe environment. Like I did the podcast with Carrie and that was good because Carrie was there. And I'd done one with Nikki, and that was good because Nikki was there, but on my own, talking into a microphone, I feel, I need to feel vulnerable to open up. Otherwise, what's the point of doing this if I'm not opening up? And I just didn't feel vulnerable enough yesterday. So... Well, I didn't record it until today, and it's supposed to be out tomorrow. 
and in the sense of the ick verbally. I have a schedule and I'm going to stick to it. Because I am lackadaisical. I need to be more disciplined. Discipline me. Where did that come from? Sorry. Okay, excuse me. So I'll let you know how this drug trial goes in the upcoming podcasts. I feel what out that one is due out on Christmas Day. Um, or oh, obviously. Okay, you get a nice special present. Don't know what I'm gonna do. I'll sing you a lovely song. Excuse me. Just yawning. Yeah, I was always thinking of keeping these episodes themed. singing a song, reading out a story, which I'm actually going to Writer's Club tonight. One of my many meetups. I suppose the last time I was talking, I told you I was going to meet up with the Leeds Gamer. Did I ever tell you how that went? I have problems in social social situations and sometimes I'm not the most talkative. Hey, how would you have ever figured that out? So it takes me a while to open up and I talk I've told you about how I talk before. I talk like a robot. I don't talk like a normal person. At a steady pace. Always thinking of things to say. I have to think of the thing and process it through my brain. And that creates gaps in for the conversation. And that's not enjoyable for anybody. Especially the least for you. Paul listener, I am so sorry for these gaps. I do try to cut them out in editing, but then that leaves the podcast running five minutes short. And <laughs> that's the realisation that I have five minutes of dead air. I know how annoying that is, so I do try to cut back on it. And I will, and I'm going to start talking like a robot from now. So. The Leeds gay men were very, very welcoming. Obviously, they weren't hostile. And I was a bit apprehensive of integrating myself. But it was a lovely environment for the first two hours. I think it was two hours. Before they moved on to a bar, and when they moved on to a bar, I couldn't handle the crowds. It was a Saturday, and they basically went to a pub. That was not my ideal environment, and I had to excuse myself. And I haven't met with them again since. The writers group is a new group, I think, was I telling Kelly about it? I think so. No, I don't think I did. (sighs) Sorry if this is me repeating myself, but the writers group involved a bunch of us sitting around a table, so just us, in like a safe environment, 
to read our work and I brought one of my stories because it was a Halloween themed writing assignment. You get a writing assignment and then you have to write something and read it out. That's the idea. Or you can just come along and listen to other people. Which is what I'm doing tonight. Because I haven't written anything. I'm barely getting this done. I couldn't do this. And see a bunch of films. And write. And have a throat infection. And start a drug trial. And on top of my regular blood transfusion. I did write something actually. I wrote a blog post. Well, it wasn't a blog, it was on Tumblr. Because I thought people might want to share it. So far, nobody has done. Which is fine by me. But I'm going to share it again with you. I'm not going to read the whole thing out. I'm just going to tell you what happened. And it links in very well. With what I was talking about earlier. Oh, I don't know if I want to go into this. It's such a... Such a weird thing that happened. I have to explain so much. Let me see. I, uh, what was I talking about? I was talking about the meeting of groups. I was going to talk about... I have all these ideas floating around before I hit record about what I'm going to talk about. And then when it comes to it, I never end up talking about what I set out to talk about. And so now to come to a point where I was going to talk about one of the things that happened last week, I'm bottling up. Because I felt it's, I feel it's been done. It's done and it's over. It happened. I don't want to dwell on it. There's nothing to do to do to dwell on. I got called a name. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't a name. I got thrown at abuse at me. Foul language, which I shan't repeat on this podcast. The F word and the C word. What? You got called a frilly chola? (laughs) So, usually, I don't, I don't give a damn about people talking about me. People pointing me out. I t- I've told you in a previous podcast that it happened on Halloween and I didn't say a thing. But sometimes it seems I want to pick I want to make an example of this person. And this was one of those times I had I'd just come out of a film. It was the final day of the film festival. I was feeling really good, happy. I wasn't feeling ill anymore. And then to have that happen, and all I was doing was being me. I was just walking through a shopping center, being me, looking like I do. Odd. To have that be pointed out in such a vulgar way, you know, there was no question you you throw something like that out to hurt the person, but I wasn't hurt. I wanted to ask that person, what, first of all, what gives you the right to say that? Why did you say that? I don't deserve that. I'm just a human. 
and you're just a human. He wasn't having any of it when I confronted him. Um, he continued to insult me and threatened to physically assault me. But this was in public, so I wasn't, I didn't feel threatened. I just thought, you know, you are a stupid person, so I'm just going to walk away. However, when I walked away, the shop assistant that kind of goes around in a circle, so when I walked away, um, he walked in a different direction, and then we came across each other again. And during that time, something, I, uh, obviously, I don't know if his girlfriend had t talked to him or whatever, um, he approached me and said, he, he was in the, he was in the wrong. He was very sorry, and he wanted to make it up to me because it wasn't me who he was, you know, saying those things to. And this is something you have to remember: if when you're bullied, you are not bullied because that person doesn't like you. You're bullied because that person doesn't like themselves. So, you know, when you're called ugly, it's that person calling themselves ugly. It's all a, a, a projection of their own negative thoughts. You know, he told me how he was bullied. And it all started to make sense. He didn't excuse his actions, and I wasn't excusing his actions. He admitted that he was completely out of line, and he more than made it up to me. He insisted on buying me a drink. And we tried to find somewhere that would serve a non-alcoholic drink, and it was this bar that has ping pong tables, and so. He bought me a drink, and we played ping pong. It, that was, like, when I initially wanted an answer to the question, who, what, gives you the right to do that, never did I think it would end <laughs> in ping pong. <laughs> But it was the dream scenario, because I've attempted this confrontation of people m making fun of me. I've attempted it twice before, and in those two previous situations, the people weren't having any of it. They, they were just like, I wasn't doing anything, I'm just an innocent person, and all of a sudden you're attacking me, whatever, and so I just walked away. You know, this was the first instance where somebody actually changed their <laughs> I don't want to say changed their life. But there was this instance in high school where I was put in a group to work. This was at the second high school. I was put in a group to work on a drama production or film skit. And. It seemed a very disjointed group. And there was one girl in particular who did not seem very happy. And so I reached out to her the most. But there was a, a hostility. I was met with a hostility. But my persistence paid off and She literally said, you know, 
I misjudged you. I just thought, you know, you were, well, I can't remember her exact words, but the gist of it, you know, was, I just thought you was, you know, disabled and that your opinion didn't matter and that, you know, you could never, you know, have a normal conversation and, you know, then she said, you know, I was, I was com completely in the wrong and you're actually one of the most stable, open-minded people in this group, the only one that I can talk to. So, you know, it pays off sometimes to talk to somebody. I don't know that I'm going to do it again if it ever happens. I don't know what possesses me to do it. I literally describe it as being outside of my body. I am on the outside looking at me being fueled by adrenaline. <laughs> Pure adrenaline. And I'm just like after that whole ping pong, like when I finally got away, <laughs> when I finally got away from these crazy people who were being nice to me, <laughs> um, I just couldn't, I, I just like, I was like thrown back into my body and I was just like trying to process what had just happened and I was just like, oh my god, oh my god, what the hell just happened? Like, I couldn't process it. I've just been running on autopilot. So I know, don't, you know, that was not, I'm not necessarily sure that I want that to happen again. And now we do the sign off. Why do I always have to introduce the sign off? It like it should have its own theme tune. I am going to take this opportunity to thank Leeds for putting on a lovely film festival, providing me with lots of food and drink, and thank you to the James and Carrie, uh, obviously James who threw the insult and Carrie who talked him down and talked him into apologising to me. Um, and you gave me a story to tell, so... And you gave me a free drink and a free ping pong game, so... It was all worth it. You can... Tweet me... At LGBTom. I have a Facebook page for the podcast, facebook.com forward slash Tom's Brain Pod. Nobody has liked it yet, but that's okay. I don't know what I would actually do if people started to listen to this and tell me that they were listening to this. The fact that I do this is just for my own sanity, and it's a new way of blogging. I, I became terrible at blogging. I wrote like three entries in a year, so this is this is progress, and also this gets me to open up. It's something I, I told you I was struggling with, and really I feel like I'm forgetting something. It's been so long since I've done one of these. I won't waste any more of your time. <laughs> Until next time, I am Thomas McNabb. You've been listening to the Tom's Brain Podcast.